Well, good morning, Life Church. My name is Dee Wigner. I am one of your campus pastors. And I'd like to just welcome each one of you for coming to Life Church this morning here online. If you're new with us, um, make sure that you fill out uh, the connecting card. Um, this will allow us to um, get to know you better, check in. We won't bug you, um, but we feel at uh, Life Church that is really important for community and all of us uh, doing life together. So uh, make sure that you fill out that connecting card and also um, sign into the chat room. Tell us hi, let us know how you're doing, how the week's going. And if you need any prayer, feel free to click the request prayer button. The campus pastors are always uh, available and happy to uh, chat with you and pray with you in private about any matters that you would like to have prayer for. I hope that you enjoy Mike's message this morning, but before we start Mike's message, let's worship our Savior through song. Well, good morning, everyone. Like Jennifer said, we're glad that you're here with us this morning. We're going to be singing a new song. It's called Not Done Yet. God of the promise, God of the future, God of the future, you see beginning and end. God of the rescue, God of the breakthrough, how great is your faithfulness. You're not done yet. No eye has ever seen, no ear has ever heard, no one could ever comprehend. Your word will be enough, your promise we will trust.
from the dry wilderness and all I did was praise all I did was worship all I did was bow down and all I out hallelujah and hallelujah you have saved me so much better your way and hallelujah great defender so much better the shade I'm living in cause you restore my faith in hope again and all I did was praise and all I did was worship and all I did was bow All I did was stay
Lord, we thank you for today and this opportunity that we have to come and gather and worship you, to lift up, lift up our voices, to receive from your Holy Spirit, to be able to gather with our fellow brothers and sisters. Lord, I pray that today would be honoring to you with everything that we have. God, and I pray for um, those of us who are coming in and maybe we've had a really hard week. Um, for those of us who are coming in and there's just a lot going on with on our minds, or maybe we're thinking about what we have going on after this service, or even something that's coming up within this week, Lord, whatever is on our mind right now that is not um, of just you alone, Lord, I pray that we would just lay that at your feet right now that we would trust you with whatever those things are that are racing in our minds. We would lay them at your feet and we would just sit in awe and wonder of you this morning. We thank you for today. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You guys can go ahead and have a seat. Well, good morning to everybody here at our main campus and online. Just a reminder now that we're doing two services. Both services um, are online. So if you can't uh, make it uh, to the main campus, both services every week will be online for you to be able to keep up because we are going through uh, a series through the Bible uh, or through the letter of 1 Corinthians. Um, so we've said from the beginning that as we do this book, you need to kind of keep up. Uh, so if you've missed a message or two, go back, listen to them, and watch them uh, because it'll help you understand what we're uh, moving into. So if you have a Bible, turn to 1 Corinthians 3. Uh, just a thought, if you were with us last week, we said we're going uh, chapter by chapter and verse by verse, but uh, we're skipping the last part of chapter 2 for the purpose of all of chapter 2 is dealing with the same thing. So instead of going through it for a second time, uh, we're just going to move on to uh, chapter 3 and uh, look at a new subject that Scripture is talking about. So 1 Corinthians 3. Now, as I was preparing the message this week, one of the things that uh, kept coming to mind is this uh, thought of how people become better. Right? So I look around and I look at people who have bettered themselves or people that um, are really good at what they do. And so my question always is, how can some people better themselves and some people can't? You know what I mean? Like, have you ever been around that? Like, you pour all this effort into this person, and you give them everything you think that they need, and they just can't get better. And then this person, you don't give them anything, but they get better on their own. You know what I mean? In life. Like, they're just, is it just natural? You know what I mean? Is it just naturally this person is just good at, you know, this certain thing, or naturally it's going to happen. doesn't matter how much time I put in or how much, you know, effort I pour into it. If they're naturally going to get it, they're going to get it. If they're not naturally going to get it, then they're never going to get it. So I was thinking through that, um, and here's where I landed on it. So for me, I think there are people who are naturally gifted in some areas that will naturally excel at those areas. But what I'm talking about is this idea of a person being successful overall, right? Not just that they're a hard worker, but maybe their organizational skills are terrible, you know, or somebody's organizational skills are terrible or good, but then their work ethic is not very good, or somebody that's good with money, but you know what I mean? I'm talking about somebody who has decided that in their life they want to be successful, and so, you know, term it however you want, but they've moved forward um, in their life. And here's what I think. So I think people that have become successful in life or people that are well-rounded people have made a conscious decision to fight a battle, right? And that battle being this, you have to fight against two enemies, one being the world, right? So they made a conscious decision to say, I'm going to live opposite of what the world says is okay, 
right? And I'm going to fight this inner tendency inside of me, like this inner self that I'm always battling against. I'm actually going to make a conscious decision to fight against the world, and I'm going to make a conscious decision to fight against my inner self. So I'll give you some examples of how, you know, this works. So think about your health for a second, right? So if you think about your health, you're always battling against this, so whether it's exercise or what you eat. So you're battling against what the world says, right? The world would tell you, oh, don't worry about preparing your food and having it ready. That's why McDonald's line is long and Wendy's line is long, because what the world tells you is go 100 miles an hour. You don't have to cook your food. Just go through the drive through It's simple, right? It's easy. And your inner self says, that's a lot of work, food prep. And, and who wants to get up? You, you know, have you ever been like this? Like it's time to get up and go to the gym at 4 o'clock in the morning. And how many times does your inner self say, that ain't happening, right? Especially after you worked out the day before, and it's not only your inner self, but your whole self, you know, is saying, I ain't getting up because nothing's working. So you know what I mean? It's like a battle that, that, you, that you're waging against this inner self that's saying, because I think that what our, our natural tendency is, is to stay the same and or comfortable. So I think people's natural decision is stay the same or stay comfortable. So you have to fight against that tendency or uh, think about your finances, right? So the world would tell you, it's your money, do what you want with it. You know, if you like it, you know, buy it. In fact, I saw this guy on TV. I hardly ever watch TV, but I turned a commercial on. This guy's dressed up in an American flag suit, and he's like, if you come down here, you're going to buy a car, right? And I hope, I hope, you know, when I say this, maybe one of you bought a car down there, but here's the idea. Like, he, you go buy a car here. It doesn't matter if your financing is terrible. You'll get financed here. Now, in the little fine print, it says at 30% interest over the next five years, but you can have a car, right? So the world's like, you want a car? It doesn't matter if you can pay for it, afford it, or any of those things. We're going to get your car. And then there's that inner self of you that's like, do I drive this heap, right? Junker, you know, that's paid for. And then I look at my friend's nice truck, you know, and it actually has air conditioning and the windows roll down and like the, there's like bedsides aren't falling off of it. You know what I mean? Like you look at those two things and there's this inner self says, you know, I don't know that I can afford it, but I still want it. You know what I mean? This battle internally that, that, that you're waging against, you know, yourself. Or you look at your resources, right? The world would tell you it's your money. You know, you can do what you want with it. You can, you know, have whatever you want. There's this inner self that would say, you know, if you really want that thing, spend it on whatever you can afford. But you see what I'm saying? There's this battle, this inner battle that always happens with the world and with yourself that's natural. Right? It's going to be a natural thing that, that uh, happens for the rest of your life. So now, take now into account that now you get saved. Okay? So now you give your life to Jesus Christ. And I think what people's thought process is, is, oh, I give my life to Jesus Christ, and those battles are over. Right? Like, I never have to worry about battling against the world anymore. I don't have to worry about battling against my inner self. So here's what Paul's going to talk about today. Here was the problem with the Corinthian church. The Corinthian church thought that way. They're like, hey, I got saved, and so I don't really have to think anymore about these battles, right? I don't have to think anymore about battling against the world. I don't really need to think about battling against myself because now I'm saved. I have a new inner self, right? And things are different for me, so I should be able to conquer anything. Well, they didn't. So the Corinthian church, the, the people inside the Corinthian church got saved, and then their life went on, and things did not go very well, right? They couldn't figure out how to live, and they couldn't figure out how they were supposed to live uh, in Christ and how they should be able to, to mature in their, their, uh, their life. So for, the, for us, it's the same way, right? So for us, this is what we're going to talk about today. When you give your life to Jesus Christ, the worldly battle and the inner battle is still going to go on. In fact, it's going to go on for the rest of your life until you meet Jesus Christ someday. So if you had some idea that if you get saved and then all of a sudden you're not going to have the world battling against you and you're not going to have that inner self that's telling you, you know, and I don't know if you guys ever have this, but you ever come to that place where it's like, you know, it's just a little sin and, and it's not that big a deal and nobody will ever know? A couple of you sin, the rest of you saints, you know, you're all right. But I'm like this, like I keep looking like, why am I having this battle? 
<laughs> Why am I even thinking about this decision? Well, the reality is, it's because your natural nature is still going to be there until you are restored someday in the kingdom of God. Your natural nature is always going to be there. You're always going to have an enemy that's going to be battling against you and always going to have somebody that's going to push against you to be able to do those things. So what do we do, right? That's what the problem in the Corinthian church was. The Corinthian church had not figured out how to live and they were spiritually immature, right? That's, that's what he's going to talk to him about. He's like, you guys are spiritually immature. What happened is you got saved and you never moved from that point forward. And you never decided, which went into, so they had their salvation, but after their salvation, what led into that then was no holy living. They had not lived or chose to live the way that God wanted them to live. So what Paul's going to talk about in this is three things. So the three things that we're going to be looking at is, how do you understand your enemy? So who is it? Right? So who's the, who is your enemy? Because for everybody that knows anything about battle, it's, if you don't know your enemy, it's hard to set up a plan of attack. Right? You need to know your enemy. and You need to understand you know, what, what, what he's trying to do for each one of us. Then you also need to understand these symptoms, just like it is when you're sick. If there are symptoms of something to come, right? Paul's going to talk about symptoms inside of you that will lead to sin before you ever get to sin. These symptoms are going to come up. You need to know what they are. You need to understand them. And if you understand them, you'll be able to fight against them. Then he's going to give us a cure. Like, what do you do? Like, how are we going to be able to uh, fight against that? So 1 Corinthians 3, where you turned um, already, we're going to, we're going to look, up, look at that. And then we're going to read all the way through it. And then we're going to break it down uh, in those three areas. So 1 Corinthians 3, we're going to start uh, there in verse 1 and read all the way through. So brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, and you are not wor- and you are jealousy and quarreling among you, and you are not worldly, are you not acting like mere humans? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, and you are not mere human beings, what after all is Apollos, and what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to each, assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters has one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. For we are co-workers in God's service, you are God's field, and God's building. So from the beginning, right, so he starts off, and I know this is easy to overlook, and I know that we've talked to him before, talked about this before, but how does Paul address the Corinthian church? He calls them, right in the beginning in verse 1, Brothers and sisters, right? Why is that so important that he calls them brothers and sisters? Why is that element, as he's getting ready to talk to them, a key for him being able to get through? Here's why it's so important. He was walking with them as a brother and not a judge, right? So he was looking at him as a brother in Christ. Because remember when I talked about in the beginning, Paul was setting all of this up because the letter is going to be very corrective, You know what I mean? Like there's going to be things where he's going to say, you're living this way and you need to live different than that. So the idea is Paul's trying to set it up saying that I'm your brother. Like I'm going down this journey and this road with you. And so not only am I going to correct you, but I'm going to be on the journey with you, which is a key element. Okay. So when we're talking about correction and we're reading the book of 1 Corinthians, here's what I don't want you to miss. Brothers and sisters don't just correct with their mouth. They correct with their life, meaning they go down the road with you. So you can't go to a brother and sister in Christ and correct them, but not be willing to go on the journey with them. Does that make sense? Like this happens way too much. People inside of the church will be, look, you know, this is what you're doing wrong and, and point out, you say, you need to correct your life. And then they go back to their own life. Is that fair? No, if you're going to correct them, then be on the journey to help them, to help them figure it out, right? That's the whole idea. And in the beginning, he's setting up this idea, and this is important to understand. So for all of us in this room, we all are are people, if you are saved, God has and wants to work his will through you. 
Okay? So God's ultimate will is to, to get everybody saved, obviously, for everybody to hear the gospel and to get saved. But he uses each one of us differently. Right? So everyone in here, has God has a plan for your life and, want, and will accomplish that plan through you. Now, here's the big thing to understand. God said he is going to work his plan through you. The question is, how's it going to go? How many detours are you going to run into? <laughs> how many roadblocks? How many times are you going to get off the road lost and you're going to be yelling at somebody else because you can't read the GPS and we should have turned where and you didn't tell me to turn there and then you're going around in circles and because you're lost, you're now frustrated with the one who was holding the GPS. You know what I mean? You can't get anything done because you're driving around in circles. Like, and the reason that you would hit the detour, the hazards, and get, lo- and get lost is because you choose not to submit to God's wisdom in your life. Right? That's part of the spiritual maturity. What he's going to talk about is this idea. Remember when we talked last week is you have a choice between godly wisdom and human wisdom? Remember last week we talked about that? So you can either choose godly wisdom or human wisdom. Paul was pretty clear. Choose godly wisdom. And when you do, you will be on the path that God wants you to be on. Choose human wisdom and you're going to be running into the hazards and the roadblocks and the things that you shouldn't be running into. And so he states from the beginning, brothers and sisters, I'm on this journey with you. We're going to do this together. And as we go down this road, God is going to work out his will in your life. So submit. Part of Christian maturity is submitting to the will of God. Then he goes on and says this, identifying uh, the problem. So the rest of verse 1. It says, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly. So we're going to talk about the difference between milk and meat, right? That's what Paul's talking about. Gave you milk in the beginning. You should actually be on meat. And we're going to talk about why does he call them infants? Right? Like, why is that a big deal and what's so important about that? So let me tell you what spiritual, when, he, when he's talking about uh, spiritual meat, I want to just clear something up before we get into this. So sometimes when people look at maturity, so people that are on milk, they would consider immature. People who are on meat, they would consider mature, right? That's what people would talk about all the time. A lot of times people think spiritual maturity when they're on meat means that you have a lot of knowledge about the Bible. Okay, that is not spiritual maturity. Knowledge about the Bible that does not turn into action in your life is not spiritual maturity. Look throughout all of Scripture. There are people that had great knowledge but did nothing with their life. In fact, look around the world today. Lots of people know way more about the Bible than they're doing anyway. Spiritual maturity is understanding what Scripture says, submitting to the will of the Holy Spirit, and doing what He asks us to do right? So that's, I just want to make sure that we clear that up before we moved on. So what is milk, All right? So let me give you some examples that I think will help explain it to you. So milk would be something that somebody else digests and then gives it to you, okay? So it digests it and gives it to you. So as an example, you know, two examples that will help you understand this. So Paul would have said, the message I gave you was milk, right? So the message I gave you, so what was the message? Salvation, and evangelism, okay? So like when you're reading through messages, when, when people would say, you know, when Paul's talking about you, the message I gave you was milk, he was saying salvation. So here was the milk message about it. So that he went to him and he'd be like, you need to get saved. Here's how you get saved. Believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. He will be the forgiver of your sins. He'll pay the penalty for your debt, right? Salvation. Now, go out and reach your friends. Pretty easy, right? Right? That's a milk message, one that, that can be given you know, to people and they can understand it. And actually, you can get people fired up about it. Right? Who doesn't get fired up about getting saved and reaching their friends? Right? So a lot of times, you, know, you get you know, these milk messages, get people fired up, but milk being that something that was digested and given back. So as an example, the message that I'm giving you this morning might have meat in it, but it is still considered milk. Why? I digested it. I spent time with God, and now I'm giving you what it, what it said, right? So I've taken the time to digest it. I'm giving it to you. So Paul's talking about if somebody digests it and gives it back to you, that's milk. It would be just like this, like you're reading books, right? So if you get a book on a topic, somebody's taken a topic, 
in, about Christianity. They've read, studied, put it together, and they wrote a book. So we read the book, and the book is essentially digested material from somebody else's point of view that now you're reading about. Does that make sense? So that's milk, right? So you give, give it digested from somebody else. Or you're listening to other preachers, or you're listening to other podcasts. People that digest things and then give it back to you is considered milk. So he was saying to the Corinthian church, nothing wrong with milk in the beginning, right? That's how everybody gets started, right? Nothing wrong with, you know, the idea that you need milk messages to get going. Here's the problem in the Corinthian church. Five years later, they're still on milk. And that's not okay, right? Like what he was saying is, is that it is not okay that you have not moved from the time that I gave you the milk to the now, you know, five years later, you're not on meat. That's not okay, right? Spiritual immaturity is not okay, right? And I want to make sure that we understand this, that the idea of spiritual immaturity is not okay in the church, right? Paul was trying to tell them, this isn't just a suggestion that you grow in spiritual maturity, it's a commandment, right? Like we need to grow in spiritual. You can't get everything from somebody else, right? Which, hence, what is meat? Meat is something that you and God digest together, right? So it's so when you sit down with God and you talk through a certain thing that you're working through and you digest it together and He speaks to you through whatever it is. That is meat because you're working it out together. And the other thing, you know, talking about messages, so it's when you and God work things out together. And the other thing, like meaty messages, you know, like when people's giving, giving a meat message, it's more around this idea, rebuke and correction, right? Rebuke and correction. Now, <laughs> think about this for a second. So the church in the United States of America, you can have the messages surrounded about get saved, reach people, or your life isn't right and you need to fix it. Which one do you think people are listening to or want to listen to? Come on. What's everybody getting excited about? The get saved, reach people messages, right? That's what people want to hear. Does anybody want to hear your life's not right, Don Patmore, and you need to live differently? Rebuke and correction. Does anybody want to come and listen to that one? No, nobody wants to hear that stuff. So we are seeing what I think is a dilemma in the Christian church today. Lots of messages on salvation and reaching people, little messages on your life ain't right and you need to fix it. And not only f not from here, like I, I think that sometimes we as teachers don't do a good job of preaching messages that are about rebu rebuking and correcting you know, like I think sometimes we shy away from those kinds of things. And, and so it's not just from here. Think about it from your perspective. Is it your responsibility to rebuke your brother and sister in Christ? Okay, let's do it this way. Is it your job to rebuke people outside of the church? No. Is it your job to rebuke brothers and sisters in the church? Absolutely. That's what he tells us to do. Which one are we better at? <laughs> Rebuking the world, aren't we? I mean, we're great at telling everybody else why they aren't living their life right. We're great at saying, well, look at those people. They're terrible in the way that they live. But you don't want to talk to your friend. You don't even want to talk to your spouse, right? Why? Why is that? Why is it so hard with somebody that you're in relationship with to rebuke them and correct them. Here's what I think. You're afraid to tell them, you're afraid to say anything to them because your fear is they're going to come back and say, well, look at the way you're living. Right? So you don't say anything at all because they're going to come back and be like, well, you know you, and when you know you, right? Because that's, that's part of the problem. Right? Part of the problem is we come to this place where we're afraid to talk to anybody because we're like, they're going to come back and say something about me. So nothing ever happens right? Nothing ever changes inside of somebody's spiritual maturity level. So here's what we have to realize. For you to be spiritually mature, you have to be able to rebuke and correct people and be rebuked and be corrected, period. If you are unwilling to go down those roads, you will never be spiritually mature, never. You have to be able to, again, from a brother's and sister's heart, 
Like, I should be able to go to Stephen and say, as a brother in Christ, here's what I see. Not only that, right? Now, don't miss this. If I go to rebuke Stephen and give him a correction and walk away from him, is that what a brother in Christ does? No, I walk the journey with him, period. If you're going to rebuke and correct, you better be willing to be on a journey. That's the way that it works, right? So you got to be able to be willing to do that, and you got to be willing to accept it. So all of us that struggle with pride, including myself, and somebody comes to me and be like, you know you, and I'm like, what do you mean me? Right? Like, I, I mean, first of all, I don't like to be told what to do, let alone to be told what I'm doing wrong. You know what I mean? Like, those, that's not even a personality thing with me. You know, I don't like that kind of stuff. And so it's a struggle, but if I want to become spiritually mature, somebody has to be able to speak into my life. Amen? And somebody has to be willing to speak into your life. And you have to be okay with it. And you have to understand they're speaking it into your life because they love you and they want to help correct you, not because they want to judge you or put you down. So that's an important aspect of spiritual maturity is, is that we understand the difference between what Paul was saying. Because I think that's a struggle not only in the Corinthian church, I think it's a struggle in the American church today. We want to hear way too much milk and we're not willing to rebuke. We'll rebuke the world, but we're unwilling to work with each other. And because of that, I think we have, a, we have churches full of spiritually immature people because no one likes to be corrected nor to tell somebody they need to be corrected because they're hard conversations. Then he goes on and he gives some examples. He says, you guys, I gave you milk. I should, have gave, should be giving you meat, but you guys are acting like babies. You guys are acting like infants, right? He says that inside of there. Now, here's the funny thing. So when Hadley comes over to our house, you know, and you put her in the high chair and, you know, and, and you get her food ready for her and you cut it all up and you put it on a spoon and you fly it around in circles and shove it in her mouth or she throws her cup off on the thing and everybody's there to pick it up or, you know, like that kind of stuff's fun. Like when babies act like babies, like that's fun to do. And it, or like... Uh, I'll sit in my chair. So in my chair, I have a bunch of books beside it. And so I'll sit in my chair. Hadley will sit up there. We'll get out this one book and we'll start reading. There's like 30 books over here. So I'll read it for like 10 seconds and then she'll go, eh. You know, and then I get another book. And I'll be like five seconds. Eh. Until I have like all 30 books piled up on, on my lap. And then we put them all back in. And then we pull them all back out and we just do it all over again, which is fun, right? Or the one thing is, is that um, when Hadley doesn't like me, you know, the thing that I figured out is that if you get something that she wants, right, like if you get her something she wants, I'll go to town and get candy bars or chocolate, like all the stuff she shouldn't have, and I'll be like, hey, Hadley, you want to come to me? You know what I mean? And so, ha like, that's fun, isn't it? Like when you can get your grandkids, like you can lure them in with the things that they want, like babies being babies, infants being infants is awesome. That's what Paul's talking about. But when adults act like babies, it ain't funny anymore right? Like, it ain't funny anymore when, when your adult children come out and be like, what's for supper? I'm like, do you know how to cook? Like, you can cook your own food. Like, seriously, do, I, do you need me to cut it up for you and fly it into your mouth too? You know, do I have to get you up and get you a drink? Right? Or like, like with Hadley, you know, it's like when she's in her bed and everybody's waiting for her to get up, you know, and everybody's excited to go up there and get her out of bed. It ain't fun when you have to go get your kid out of bed for work. Right? Like, that stuff isn't funny anymore. You know what I'm saying? Like, when your adult kids act like babies, that kind of stuff isn't funny anymore. And that's what Paul's trying to say. Paul's trying to say to the Christian church, this isn't funny anymore. This isn't funny anymore. Like, you thought it was okay to be on milk. Ha, ha, ha. You know, here's your message. Five years later, you're still on milk. This isn't funny anymore. Just like it is when we look naturally at, at adult people who act like babies, immaturity, nobody likes it, and, but everybody puts up with it in the church. Why? You know what I mean? Like it doesn't make any sense that we will accept immaturity in the church when it comes to spiritual growth, but you would never accept it from your children. You would never accept it from a coworker that's acting like a baby. Like you would never accept those types of things. And that's what Paul's trying to say. This is unacceptable, right? You need to move to a different place because spiritual immaturity is not okay. 
right? And you need to do something about it to be able to correct it. And you need to figure out how are you going to correct it? Like, what does it look like for you to be able to get to meet? And what does it look like for you to be able to, you know, move forward, you know, in, in uh, your journey when, when you're trying to understand how to become spiritually mature? Now, understand this. So from a church's perspective, here's one of the things that we've talked about. Like, I think that churches can organize around creating spiritually immature congregations. Like, I really think they're going to happen. Like, I think that you can, like, uh, when you come and do Discover Life, we give you the cruise ship battleship analogy. So if you've ever been to Discover Life, you've heard this. So we say that organization of a church is really important. So we think some churches organize to create infants, right? Like babes in Christ. We think that spiritual immaturity is completely okay because the idea is like being on a cruise ship. So if you go on a cruise ship and you don't like your food, is somebody getting you more food? Yes. If you've never been on one of those, like you put on the wristband, you get whatever you want. Like you don't like the way your bed's made or fluffed. You didn't like the animals that they made your, you know, towels into. They'll make you all kinds of animals, whatever you want to do. Like if you're not happy, they're making you happy. Right, the whole idea of being on that vacation cruise ship is to make sure that all of your needs are met. And at the end of the day, if you organize church that way, because you know what the center of immaturity is in a Christian? Selfishness. The center of immaturity in Christian people is being selfish, right? And so if you create a church that builds into selfishness, what do you think you're going to create? Selfish Christians, right? Where we said, listen, <laughs> I've been down that road. I am not going to organize Life Church that way. Like, I've been down the road of trying to keep people happy at a country club. I'm not doing that anymore. Like, that's not in my DNA. It's not who I am. So, when we create Life Church, I want to create it around the idea of a battleship. Like, here's the deal come on in, take the tour. We'll show you the kitchen, the bedrooms, the guns, the, the place where you, you know, the captain's deck. We're going to show you it all. But when it's time to push away from the dock, man your station and stop giving excuses why you can't. There's a war. What's your excuse? Spiritual immaturity says, I got an excuse for everything. Spiritual maturity says, show me where to go. I'll man, I'll man the station. I don't care what's going on. Like, you can get every excuse in the world. And so I said that. Like, I want to organize a church around that. Listen, we know that there's a war going on. If you don't want to be on the ship, don't be on the ship. But when you're on the ship, can you man a station? Because when you're, there, there is a true enemy that is after, you know, God's people. And we need to have a part in figuring out what to do. And so spiritual maturity would say, just show me where to go. I don't care if I'm washing dishes if we're defeating the enemy right? I don't have to be on the gun. I don't have to be the captain. But if I'm on the ship, I have something to do to make the ship run. That's what he's talking about when it comes to spiritual maturity. We have to understand what that looks like because, again, spiritual maturity can only happen if you are selfless and if you're willing to be corrected, right? If you're unwilling to be corrected, because just like uh, you remember when I was telling you the story about how you get Hadley to come to you? Like if there's five people in a room and everybody has something, it's one she wants is where she goes. You ever done that with your kids or when they're younger, your grandkids? Like everybody holds up something because they want them to come to them. And if you got the thing that she wants, guess where she's going? To you. Do you know that's what's happening in the church today? Everybody's holding up what you want and people are going to the one that they want. They have what they want, right? That's not the way it's supposed to work. The church is not here holding up a candy bar that you like to be able to go to the place where they agree with your philosophy of life. Because you could never be rebuked or corrected if you will go to somebody who will never rebuke or correct you. And people are going to churches where they go where nobody's going to rebuke and correct them. That's why they're still at the church, right? Instead of just saying, you know what? I'm under this leadership. And so for right now, I'm going to take it. You know what I mean? I'm going to be rebuked. I'm talking to myself too. So I'm not just talking. I'm going to, whatever I'm doing wrong, I want to be better. I want to be mature. I want to be used in the war. I don't want to be sitting on the sidelines. I don't want to be left at the dock when the ship's out there, you know, engaged in battle. I want to be used. And the only way I can be used is to be okay with like, get your life right, figure it out. Let's get down this journey and let's do it together. Then 
He goes on, he gives some of the symptoms, right? So some of the symptoms are the end of verse 3 when he says this uh, in 3 through 5. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? For when one says, I follow Paul, and the other, I follow Apollos, are you not mere human beings? After What, after all, is Apollos, and what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned each task. So he's saying, again, the center of all this, what was happening with the Corinthian church, is they were being selfish. They're like, well, I want to listen to Paul, and I want to listen to Apollos. I want, you know what I mean? They were trying to get their way inside of the church. And he's saying, listen, the symptoms of, right, the sin coming is when you start viewing church from a selfish manner, okay? And I, I want to make sure everybody gets this. When you make decisions to say, I'm not coming to church because they don't do, check yourself. Because it shouldn't be why you're coming to church anyway, right? Maybe. Anybody? We're still out here to make sure we're still good, right? Like this idea that if you're, if people, because people do this all the time. Well, I'm not coming until they, well, I'm not coming until they, I'm like, you're not doing what? I didn't know this was for you anyway, right? Like I didn't know that you coming was just about what you wanted. Like I thought the reason that you were coming is for other people, right? Like we're all going to get something here today, hopefully, but we're all going to get something, but you realize you're not here for you. You're here to be filled up, to pour out. Like, that's why you're here. And you're right. The church ain't going to have everything. The church is not going to have all those things in place. So part of the symptoms that can creep up inside of you is when you start feel that selfishness coming up, like, go through the list of stuff in the beginning. Like, when you start looking at your time like it's your time, is it your time as a Christian? There's 168 hours in a week. Is it yours or is it his? It's his, Right? All of your resources, when you start looking at them as yours, are they yours or his? I know this one's harder. His, for sure, right? Like, it's all his stuff. So when you start thinking, like, if you go all to those things we talked about in the beginning, if you start thinking through those stuff and you start to become selfish over that, I'm just telling you what's going to creep in or what you should be aware of is selfishness is an indicator of spiritual immaturity. Right? It's just an indicator. And again, it's not to be like, you're so immature, Dan. You're terrible. No, it's to say, you know what? Here's a symptom. I better fix it before it gets out of hand. Which only makes sense, doesn't it? Right? Like if you got a symptom of something, you fix it before it gets out of hand. Spiritual immaturity starts creeping up, fix it before it gets out of hand. That's the important part about uh, looking at this and understanding those symptoms. The next one is, so what's the cure then, right? So here's what he says in verse 6. He says, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. For we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. So what is the cure, right? So what do we need to do to move us to a place of spiritual uh, maturity. And so the band's going to come back up. So let me leave you with this. Okay. So if you look at it, so identify your enemy, right? Identify who your enemy is and understand, you know, that, that we need to be moving towards spiritual maturity and you need to have an, a battle plan. You need to be able to, to, to figure out how to attack. Understand symptoms, right? If you start to see yourself becoming selfish, then you need to deal with those and understand it. But at the end of this, he gives us the, the idea of what we should be looking at and what the cure is going to be. So he gives us this uh, agricultural metaphor. So I think, you know, some of you guys are involved in agriculture on a big level. Maybe some of you guys are on a garden level, you know, or maybe you've seen some of these things. But here's what we know about agriculture. If you are going to produce a good crop, is it all dependent upon you? See, in the first service, I looked at all the farmers and they went, I'm like, it's okay. Nobody else is looking at you. It's just me. Like, I'm the one looking at you. Nobody else is like, no, it doesn't work, right? Like, you do your part. And then there are other things that have to fall into place. And if all those things fall into place, then a crop is going to grow, right? Same concept. Spiritual maturity understands this. We all have a part. 
But for things to grow, it's completely dependent upon God. Right? Like for things to grow, everything is dependent upon God. For us to grow spiritually mature, God has to do a work inside. Like we have to do our part, like do your devotions, come to church, do all that stuff. But God inside of you is the one that grows it. When you look at a church, you know, nobody can sit here and say, well, the reason the church is growing because what an incredible worship team. And that's why everybody comes. No. What an incredible worship team. Yes, but the church will not grow because of a worship team. The church will grow, not, let me take that back. The church might grow for a little while because of a worship team, but it will not have longevity if people are coming because of the worship team. Pastors can attract people for a moment, but not for a journey forever. God is the one who grows the church, period. We all have a part. The question is, or you're doing your part, right? Or all of us, and, and here's what I want you to give you some action steps to think about this week. I want you to take an opportunity this week to identify your enemy. You know how I said, we're fighting against the world and we're fighting against your inner self. So there might be some very specific things for you right now when it comes to the world that's pressing on you. You know what I mean? Things that are tempting you that you need to, to, to identify. And there's going to be some things internally that you're struggling with, like these internal struggles of maybe some sin in your life right now. You need to identify this is the enemy. Now, don't just leave it there. What's going to be your battle plan? What's going to be your battle plan? Don't just leave it there and say, I got an enemy and the world's coming against me. You can't just leave it at that point. You got to decide, and this is what I'm going to do about it, right? Spiritual maturity doesn't just identify. Spiritual maturity puts into action what they need to do and trust God for the things that they can't do, right? That's how spiritual maturity works. The other thing that I want you to do, and, and take this the right way, <laughs> because I'm saying it to myself, stop acting like a baby. <laughs> stop being a baby. Wherever we are spiritually immature, fix it. You know what? We all do it. We've all had it, right? We've all acted like kids. We've all acted like we shouldn't when it comes to spiritual maturity. I want to identify, and I've been thinking a lot about this, what am I doing, right? Where in my life is spiritual immaturity, you know, and the things that I do, where is that creeping its head up, and what do I need to do to be able to fix uh, those things in my life? And the last one is this, just do your part, right? Here's what I love about God's kingdom. But I can wash the dishes and he can still bring people to his kingdom. <laughs> I'm so glad that it's not dependent upon me. I'm so glad that I just get to do my part. I'm so glad that whatever he asks me to do, I'm going to do it and I'm going to trust the increase for him. I am so glad that my spiritual maturity is not dependent upon everything that I do, but God working inside of me. I'm going to do my part. But when God does his part, and we see ourselves grow in our relationship and maturity with him, the kingdom has changed forever. The world has changed forever. And so my question to you today, ask yourself this, am I immature? Have I been immature and what have been my excuses and what do I need to change? Where do I need to stop being like a baby and giving excuses for everything that we're doing? And where do I need to change my life? And, and instead of talking about it, which we're all good at sometimes, do something. Just do something, and I think you'll be surprised what God will do in your life. All right, will you stand so I can pray for you? So, Heavenly Father, we come to you today understanding that um, we all struggle with uh, spiritual immaturity, Lord. We all know sometimes we act like babies. Lord, I pray today that you open our eyes to the enemy, the enemy in this world that's that's trying to get to us and to keep us at a level of immaturity. I pray, Lord, that we'll identify these inner struggles that are going on and we'll allow the power of the Holy Spirit to overcome those things. Lord, I pray that you give us the wisdom to put a plan of attack together. Heavenly Father, I pray that you will reveal to us where we are immature. That, that we won't be so prideful, Lord, that, that we won't see the things that we really need to see. And Lord, I pray that you give us the courage to just do something, play our part, 
whatever it is, and allow the increase to be yours. And let's watch ourselves grow and watch the kingdom grow with it. Heavenly Father, we love you. In your name we pray. Amen.
You know, as we were singing that song, one of the things that spoke to me is this whole idea, right? That I may be weak, which is okay, because the spirit is strong, right? But you don't have to have it all together. You don't have to have everything fixed. You don't have to have it all figured out. It's okay to recognize that we are weak, but the spirit is strong. And because of that, and because of our understanding of our weakness and his strength, he will lead us into spiritual maturity. So that's my prayer uh, for you guys this week. So thanks for being here at our main campus. Thanks to everybody that joined us online, and we'll see you guys again next week. Well, that finishes this week's um, sermon uh, here at Life Church. Just want to thank each one of you again for joining us. I hope that each one of you have a very blessed week, and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Feel free to um, stay online and chat with us. Um, Again, if you haven't filled out that connecting card, make sure you do. And we look forward to seeing you again next week. God bless. Never find